Good afternoon, this is Quintus Curtius, and welcome back to the podcast. And today we have a uh, very interesting subject here. The subject of today's podcast is going to be the 15 greatest military commanders in history. So what I'm going to try to do is to select who are, in my opinion, the 15 most influential or greatest military commanders in history. And I'll tell you what, this is uh, the type, constructing this type of a list is always going to be a exercise fraught with dangers and pitfalls and errors and mistakes and judgment calls because it's highly, sele- it's highly subjective. It's highly subjective. Uh, you know, there are so many great commanders out there. There are so many great generals who have distinguished themselves by their valor and their deeds over the millennia, over the centuries, that it's very, very difficult to try to pare down a list of 15. So inherently, this type of thing is a is a rash exercise, and I understand that. However, it still does have a useful purpose, because hopefully it will generate some interest in you listeners to go off on your own and to try to read more, maybe study some biographies, study some histories, about these various characters so you can satisfy your own curiosity as to their importance or relative uh, lack of importance. Because I'm sure there are many people who are going to disagree with my my selections. I'm sure I'm going to get, oh, how could you have left off so-and-so, or why didn't you include this, or you included so-and-so. He was uh, he was terrible. He did nothing. He was He sucked. You know, you're just, you're just, uh, you have your own preferences, and you're just, Okay, I get it. I get all that. I get it. But at some point, we have to try to make the cutoff. We have to try to come up with some list. And I think if I explain to you the rationale and the method of my selection, then at least I can claim that I based it on some sort of rational criteria. There at least was a method. I didn't just grab these names out of the sky. I didn't just grab these names out of the sky. There was a criteria here. And and these were the two main criteria that I used. Number one, I selected these names based on their their relative influence in history. In other words, how influential were these generals? What results did their conquests or their campaigns produce? That was number one. And number two, I tried to evaluate these generals based on their economy of management. And what I mean by that is, did they do a great deal with the limited tools that they had? In other words, what I mean by that is, I consider one of the elements of greatness the ability to to, um, accomplish many things with limited resources. And I value that man who can accomplish a great deal with limited resources more than that man who simply sits atop a pile of resources and uh, extends uh, his nation's influence a little bit more. So I, for, the, for that reason, you're, you may see uh, men in this list who may not have had a tremendous influence in history, but nevertheless accomplished a great deal within the limited confines of, uh, of their immediate uh, historical period and their geographic limitations and, and limitations based on climate and geography and circumstances. And also, I think the final important criteria is I have not tried to compare different commanders from different time periods. You know, we've got, there, there, are, there are great men in every time period, ancient, uh, medieval, early modern, and modern periods. And you have to compare, when you're judging greatness, you, you have to compare, uh, and this applies not just to generals, but to, I think, great figures in, in general, whether it's literature or whether it's science, whether sports, whatever, whatever category we're talking about, you have to compare individuals to the, the time in which they flourished. Because otherwise, our comparisons are unfair. And unreasonable. So, having laid out those ground rules, let's launch now into our list. And what I will do is I will, it's it, for a podcast this size, it's impossible for me to recap 
the campaigns and the experiences of all 15 of these guys. But what I want to do is at least mention their names, uh, give the dates of their birth and death, and then just say a few words about their major achievements. And then I will let you exercise your own initiative and go off on your own and explore further. All right, so without further ado, number one, Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan, who lived from 1162 to 1227, the great Khan of the Mongols, unquestionably, I think, uh, has to be ranked as the greatest military commander uh, in history because this was a guy who came from literally nothing. He, he came from literally nothing. He was basically an abandoned child in many ways who not only unified his own people, who had up to that point had a negligible influence on history, the Mongols, and organized an army, levied uh, tremendous uh, forces, uh, and used tactical innovations and brilliant uh, leadership and um, stratagems to conquer the greatest land empire that the world has ever seen. A land em empire that extended from the gates of Europe all the way uh, to, uh, to China. And for that reason alone, we have to say that, that the great Khan uh, is unquestionably uh, the, the, the greatest military commander in history. If we, now again, his, his empire fell apart after, in, in the centuries after his death, so arguably he did not have a tremendous influence in history, but size counts for something. And I think we have to counterbalance that fact with the fact that he conquered the greatest land, empi land, land empire in history. And this was an extremely intelligent man, extremely intelligent man, and I think in many ways we're handicapped by our lack of first-hand sources. Uh, there was no, at least as far as I'm aware of, there was no historian on his campaigns writing, uh, writing about his, his uh, campaigns in great detail. So we have to kind of rely on the word of his enemies, mostly, and that is often not favorable. But he used a mixture of ruthlessness, terror, and tactical innovations especially with cavalry, especially especially with cavalry uh, and archery, which the Mongols excelled at, to conquer a tremendous land empire. All right. Number two, Alexander the Great, the great Macedonian king who lived from uh, 356 BC to 323. Again, a an incredible commander who never lost a battle, uh, extended Greek influence all the way from the shores of the Mediterranean, well, actually from Macedonia to the, literally to the to the to the gates of the uh, to to the shores of the Ganges River in India, and not only was he a master tactician, this was a, this was a, a commander who excelled in many different fields in siege warfare. If you look at his siege of Tyre in Phoenicia, uh, his construction of a mole there, I, I wrote an article about this for my site uh, some years ago and his uh, amazing ability to adapt to the requirements of different terrains and geographies and to build coalitions with local tribes and nations. This was a man of, of superlative and, and unrivaled military abilities. Uh, he had his faults, of course, but also what I think is important is the degree of influence that he had because even after he died and after his successors fought over his domain, he had a tremendous amount of influence on history because of the the fact that he extended uh, Greek culture and Greek civilization into Asia and Egypt, uh, an, an influence which, which lasted for uh, another few hundred years, uh, and in many ways persisted uh, up to and even after the Islamic conquests. So again, Alexander the Great, uh, one of the great uh, certainly belongs in the top five great commanders of history. This list is not necessarily, the list I'm going to give, by the way, is not necessarily an ordered ranking. Okay, I think Genghis Khan certainly, Genghis Khan and Alexander certainly should be up there, but the others, I think we can substitute, we can, I'm not going to say that I'm, I'm ranking them all in specific order. I mean, we can shuffle the relative importance of these, but I think that the they should all be in the top 15. All right, number three, Hannibal. Hannibal the Carthaginian who lived from 247 to 182 BC. Um, you know, Hannibal is just a, a, one of those fascinating figures that I just really love. I, I really idolize this guy, a great man. Uh, 
And I, I could tell you so many anecdotes. I could talk for hours about Hannibal, which I will not do. But uh, th because there are so many great stories of his, of his cunning and his trickery that are related in Polybius, Livy, uh, Cornelius, Nepos, and uh, we could just go on and on. But basically, this, even though he ultimately failed in his endeavors, uh, his tactical uh, and strategic brilliance cannot be denied. They were so overpowering that they, that they compensate for his relative lack of um, influence in his, um, in his conquests. And if we look at just the, the audacity to enter Italy through the Alps with an army and then to just defeat a, a very, very tough opponent. I mean, the Romans in those days were very, very tough. And he just shattered them one battle after another. Lake Trasimene, the great battle of Cannae, which is considered by many to be the classic, uh, probably the most devastating the most devastating single battle, maybe in all of history, where you had literally 50,000 Roman troops just 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 be slaughtered by this unbelievable de uh, double envelopment, and it's easy to forget and this this in ancient times 50,000 to lose 50,000 men in one battle that was a tremendous, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 that's literally the, the size of the entire uh, amount of casualties America lost in Vietnam in one day. It's just it just boggles the mind, and for an ancient army where population sizes were much smaller than they are now, th this was equivalent to almost absorbing a nuclear attack. And it's a credit to the Romans that they bounced back. I mean, the Romans were tough; they, they were very tough. And so Hannibal was resorted, had to resort to spending the next fifteen years floundering around the countryside trying to trying to organize a rebellion of, um, of the Italic peoples against Rome, which ultimately proved to be un unsuccessful. So I don't want to get too much into Hannibal's campaigns, but I think he certainly belongs in the top five commanders uh, as the greatest of all time. All right, number three, Khalid ibn al-Walid, or his full name in Arabic, Khalid ibn al-Walid ibn Mughira al-Makhzumi. And he was, he lived from 585 AD to 642. He was the first, the, um, uh, he, he was essentially the, the architect of the, the Islamic conquests in the medieval period. And he engaged in well over a hundred battles, never lost a battle. And he engaged uh, various different uh, uh, Arabian tribes. Uh, the per he, he uh, uh, was responsible, laid the groundwork for the for the subjugation of Persia, the Persian Empire, and also um, delivered crushing defeats to the Byzantine Empire as well. So, um, not only was he tactically and and strategically brilliant, but he was a tremendously influential commander in the sense that the rise of the, the the appearance of the Islamic conquests in the medieval period certainly must rank as as the most um, the most some of the most decisive uh, events or the most decisive military event in, in the medieval period, and this was essentially due to the military competency of the commanders of of the um, of the Arab commanders who actually had to carry out these conquests. Now he didn't do it all himself, and his uh, achievements were built on by later generals that came after him, but he really was the uh, the keystone or the the um, the seminal figure in the early Islamic conquests. So for that reason alone, uh, and again, this was a man who had very little, if any, military training. It's amazing about many many of the names on this list, list were not professional mil military men, just like some of the greatest artists were not professionally trained. They just had an inherent genius for organization, for carrying out uh, these combinations and campaigns that was uh, not, not excelled by anyone, uh, any of their contemporaries. All right, let's move on here to uh, Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar. And this was, all, uh, he lived, uh, a Spanish uh, general lived from 1043 to 1099. Colloquially, colloquially known as uh, El Cid in Spanish uh, folklore, which also actually probably comes from El Sayyid, the Arabic word El Sayyid, which means like a sir or an honorific title of sir or, or uh, master. Um, 
you know, he was is a, it remains sort of a controversial figure because he not only fought against uh, the uh, the Moors in Spain, he not only fought against uh, the the um, uh, the um, the um, uh, Islamic forces that were in Spain and North Africa at that time, but he also uh, fought against other. Uh, uh, he also fought against Christians as well. So uh, he, but where I think he derives his influence and his importance was he, in in some degree at least, or to a large degree, his legend and his um, his conquests laid the foundation or laid the the germanus the the um, uh, planted the seed for the the foundation of the modern spanish uh, the castilian state and by any measure the the um, the influence of spain on history has been tremendous uh, because it was only through the unification of spain that the explorations into the new world could have taken place and with that the the spread of the spanish language and culture to a sizable to a significant portion of the globe, uh, you know, all the way to the Philippines, and we have to we have to really look at the, these architects, these nation builders. That's another thing about this list. Many of the people on this, many many of the men on this list were not just generals; they were nation builders. They were nation builders, and I think this is where we see the interconnection between military prowess and political prowess. To be a great general, I think you also have to be not just a tactician, but you have to be a, a diplomat. You have to be a negotiator. You have to be a a, um, a compromiser. You have to be someone who can who can master all elements of the field of struggle, and that's really what uh, Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar uh, did. If you really study his his uh, his campaigns. All right, next, Saladin, Salahadin el Ayubi. The great Saladin, a very famous uh, medieval Islamic uh, commander who fought against the Crusaders. He lived from 1137 to 1193, and I'm ranking him in the top 15 simply because of because I believe he was a very influential figure even to this day. And he was fighting against tremendous odds. He had to contend really against a, a European invasion of uh, his of his immediate region, and he had to not only subjugate the invaders but he also had to unify he was not he was remember he was he, he was also a, a political figure as well as a general and he had his own little empire not little but he had his own substantial empire and he had to not only manage a invasion an assault from outside but he also had to secure his rear guard he had to secure his back and he did this through again a combination of real ruthlessness utter i mean he was utterly ruthless and also military uh, competency, and also he was just as much of a gentleman as as um, as the history books make him out to be. And in reading the discourses and the exchanges between him and some of the European commanders, especially Richard the Lionhearted, are some of the most are some of the most awe-inspiring and, and some of the most admirable and noble exchanges that we really read about in, in all of history. Just the idea of, of this sort of uh, nightly courtesy that could be exchanged between bitter enemies is just somehow very uh, real, really speaks of a, uh, uh, you know, greatness of soul. So Salahuddin al-Ayubi well, uh, is, is on the list. Next after him, um, Ieyasu Tokugawa or depending how we want to say it, Tokugawa Ieyasu. He, he lived from 1543 to 1616, and he was the the um, the architect of the Tokugawa shogunate in Japan. And as I said, again, a nation builder, not just a great general, but he fought over 90 battles, and he really laid the groundwork for the unified state of modern Japan. And by any measure... The Japanese Empire and, the, and then the Japanese uh, state, uh, modernly as we call it, uh, has been a tremendously influential nation and culture in world history, at least since the, the early modern period. So for that reason, I think we have to put Tokugawa up there in the top 15 list, just simply because the influence, even though he may not have had um, a great deal of um, you know, tactical innovations, although I think he did, which I can't go into, 
Uh, he was a, a master of, of intrigue and coalition building and subjugations. And the ultimate result of his, of his conquests were enduring and far-reaching. So Ieyasu Tokugawa has to be up there with the greats. Next, Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great of Prussia, 1712 to 1786. And, you know, I really like Frederick the Great. He's a, he's a very fascinating figure uh, if you read a biography of him. He started out as a, uh, giving all indications uh, that he was going to be a worthless dandy. And uh, he turned into be, he grew into being a very ferocious and implacable military commander just through the force of his own will. And what I like about Frederick the Great was he fended off a coalition of powers. At one point, after he tied, tried to take um, Silesia in the, the War of the Austrian Succession, he was attacked uh, by a, a coalition of, of, of numerous powers, you know, Russia, Austria, uh, a few others, and he somehow managed to fend off all of them until uh, favorable terms could be secured. So this was a guy who knew the meaning of hang in there and fight it out. Hang in there and fight it out. That's Frederick the Great. This guy was, um, uh, again, ruthless, opportunistic in many ways, but he was also a very urbane, cultured man, a, a philosopher as well as a king who had, uh, at, well, at least at one point, had good relationships with some of the great intellectuals of his day, including Voltaire and others. Uh, so very, very to me. And also, I think if we if we talk about influence, I think you, a good argument could be, could be made that he laid the groundwork for the modern uh, unification of the German nation, which by any standard uh, has been a, an extremely influential nation in European and, and world history. Uh, and so for that reason alone, I think we also have to give him credit for being one of the top commanders. All right, next, Napoleon. Now, what 1769 to 1821 were his dates of birth and death. What more can we say about Napoleon than what has not already been said? Uh, he conquered a huge, uh, a huge uh, European empire. Again, a guy who rose from obscurity as an in, as a um, a relatively insignificant artillery officer from Corsica, and managed to make himself the emperor of the French, and to embark on a campaign of conquest that stretched to the gates of Moscow from the Atlantic Ocean to the gates of Moscow. Now, to be perfectly honest, you know, for some reason, and, I, and I'm not really sure why it is, I've read a couple biographies of, of Napoleon. He's never really excited my interest for some reason in the same way some of these other guys have. And I don't know why. There's Maybe there's just something about his personality that just I've just never really warmed to Napoleon for whatever reason. I've not written about him very often. And you know, there's there is some argument out there as to really how uh, how great of a commander he was. He has his detractors, uh, but I think certainly he brought an end to I think the the old fashioned era of warfare and ushered in an entirely new era of warfare that really was based on citizen armies, and we would see that really develop to the fullest extent during the American Civil War. So he was a tremendously influential figure. All right, next. Hernán Cortés, Hernán Cortés, or Hernando Cortés, 1485 to 1547, and this was the adventurer and general, captain general who conquered Mexico for the Spanish crown. Again, uh, he, uh, influence here is what matters, okay? And if we look at economy of management, one of the factors I talked about at the beginning, this guy had only a handful of men. With only a handful of men, he managed to land at uh, Tabasco in, in the, on, the, um, on the Mexican coastline and march all the way from there to Tenochtitlan, to the capital of the, um, the Aztec Empire. And, and at first he was chased away. He was beaten on his first approach. And then he came back and, and conquered the city, overthrew the, 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 uh, overthrew the empire and conquered it uh, for Spain. By any standard, by any standard, this must rank as one of the most incredible feats of military uh, generalship in history. Because 
the audacity i don't i just don't think people truly appreciate the level of audacity that it took uh for someone to to conceive of this and again it was all on his own initiative he was operating under the flimsiest of permissions from the spanish uh, government uh, permissions in cuba and he basically was just doing this on his own and he could have at any, at any time have been killed but when you really read about his exploits and if you, if you do have to read i'd recommend bernal diaz the history of the conquest of mexico who was a, a soldier who fought with cortez and wrote a very priceless account of the campaign you can see not only was Cortes a, a military genius in terms of uh, constructing his campaigns, but he was also a master diplomat. He knew how to use all the weaknesses of the Aztec Empire against it. You know, the, 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 the various Indian tribes that Cortes encountered along his march to Tenochtitlan hated the, the Aztecs, uh, which is something that's not often understood, is the, the Aztecs were hated by many of the Indian uh, nations there, uh, and they were more than willing to help Cortes overthrow the hated overlord, which was which was the Aztecs. So, uh, again, this was a toss-up here whether to, to include uh, Cortes or, or uh, Pizarro, who was the later conquistador who, who brought about the conquest of Peru, of Peru later but i think the crown because there are arguments that can be made that even that pizarro was even more was pizarro's feats were even more impressive but i don't agree i think cortez was the first i think mexico was a a much more was a much um i think more, more productive richer i think more culturally influential region than than peru has proven to be and nothing nothing against peru because they were tremendous um uh, you know, riches that came out of there as well in terms of metallic riches. Uh, uh, but I, I think Cortes was the one who paved the way. He was the he was the first. So I think the the crown has to go to him, and where, whether uh, him or Pizarro should uh, uh, should be given the the crown as who's the greatest conquistador. Okay. Next, Heinz Guderian. Heinz Guderian, fast Heinz Guderian, the architect who li he lived from 1888 to 1954, the architect of the Blitzkrieg strategy of uh, the German army in the Second World War. And let's face it, by any standard, uh, by any measure, I think military, military historians will agree that the Wehrmacht, the, the, the German army of the Second World War, was one of history's uh, greatest, uh, uh, in terms of technical competence and ability, was, uh, was one of history's great armies. Uh, most successful armies, and in in, when you look at what was accomplished with the tools that they had, and arguably, if um, if certain generals had been listened to, possibly the outcome of the war could have been, might have been, very different. But we'll never know. But Heinz Guderian was the architect of the Blitzkrieg uh, combined arms strategy, and the reason why I think he belongs uh, is because this was a a, a tremendous this I the, the whole. Most modern militaries really base their strategies on this whole combined arms concept, you know, using armor and air power and various different onslaughts all at once. And this all goes back to some of the, the innovations that the German army developed at the outset of the Second World War. And I don't think that's fully appreciated. And again, Guderian was not the only one. There were others. But we have to try to pick someone out as the man to give the credit for. And I think his name certainly ranks higher than most of the others and if we look uh, so in other words so so he he makes this list simply because of his influence the conquests of uh, of his nation did not last obviously they were of extremely short duration but his influence i think was tremendous and remains very very significant to this day all right next um uh, Timur, Tamerlane, Timur Lenk, who lived from 1336 to 1405, and, and this was a, um, a Central Asian conqueror of the medieval period, and um, again, a very, very little known figure, I think, to this day in the West, and I, and I hope that people will take this as a cue to read more about uh, Tamerlane, but um, Timur was... Um, was very much in, in many ways a lot like a Genghis Khan and he conquered uh, vast regions in Central Asia uh, you know Persia uh, northern India 
you know, stretching down into the Caucasus. I mean, he, he really, uh, and he was not only an extremely intelligent man, but a tactical innovator. And I think we're in many ways we're handicapped by not having as many first-hand accounts as we wish we could have. And I think if we did have as much source material about his campaigns as we have maybe on some of the Western uh, generals, we would have a very different opinion uh, as to his influence in history. So, and the other th shocking thing that I think needs to be said about Timur was he was a master at the use of terror and civilian terrorization. Now, you can say that that's not a, a criteria of greatness, but no one can deny that warfare in the modern period has been characterized by brutality towards uh, civilians and, and that the experience of the, the First and Second World Wars have shown us that, uh, I, for lack of a better word, you know, terror against, against civilian populations is, is, has now been a feature of modern warfare. And in many ways, this dates back to ruthless conquerors like, like Tamerlane, who started this practice. And so, again, I think his influence in history has been uh, significant. His tactical brilliance is undeniable, and he certainly belongs on the list. Uh, and, you know, I think you you can tell from this list so far from what I've gone through that I've tried to take a global perspective. I've, I've, I've tried to remove our perspective from a limited Western perspective, try to look at the entire world, because it's important, I think, if we're going to talk about the, the 15 greatest commanders in history, we have to look at the whole world, not just our own uh, backyard. All right, next. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant. Ulysses S. Grant, who lived from 1822 to 1885. Now, I know there are probably some of you rolling your eyes and saying, why does he deserve to be, to be long on this list? And I'll tell you why. Again, because I see Ulysses S. Grant as the architect, the military architect of the modern United States. In many ways, I think you can see the Civil War in the United States in the 1860s as a war of unification. It was the the moving away from the old United States to the creation of a new unified nation. Okay, And no one can deny that the United States has been a tremendously, if not the most influential nation in the post-war, since the 20th, well, certainly since the 20th century in terms of influence on world history and popular culture, et cetera, et cetera. And none of this would have been possible if the United States had not secured its influence through military victories. And arguably, it would have, the United States would have always remained a backwater, a relatively uh, non-influential uh, sort of a, a up-and-comer that never quite realized its potential if the nation had not been unified. And I think from my study of Ulysses S. Grant's campaigns in his life, he was one of the few. He was, he and possibly, arguably, uh, you know, Winfield Scott and arguably uh, William Tecumseh Sherman. He understood that if the Civil War were to be won, if the nation were, if the rebellion were to be put down, uh, it could not be done through maneuvering, through this pirouetting around, this sort of flanking maneuvers, this sort of Napoleonic song and dance that a lot of other Union generals were advocating, men like, um, uh, whom I consider to be not good generals, men like um, um, McClelland. Uh, it, it was only Grant. Grant was a prophet of modern war. I mean, he understood that the only way that the Confederacy was going to be beaten was if it were battered and pounded and blasted and bludgeoned into submission and that it was not going to be a short war it was not going to be an easy war it was going to be a war destructive beyond anyone's imagination and it was going to involve the creation of hundreds of thousands of casualties but this was what it took this is what was necessary this is what was necessary to win the war and there are very few men in that era Lincoln was one of them. Abraham Lincoln was one of them, and Grant understood it eventually. But even Lincoln, at first, did not fully understand this. But I think Grant did on some primitive level. And Grant was a fighter. He was a tr he was a tenacious fighter. He was like a bulldog, and, and if you let him if you let him at it, he would put his head through a wall. 
He was, he was, he was going to come after you, and he was not going to stop. And that, my friends, is what I admire. That's the ethic that I've tried to cultivate, and I've repeatedly exhorted uh, over and over and over again. Go at them. Hit them hard. Keep hitting them. Uh, so in terms of his military innovations and in terms of the influence that I think his conquests had, he must rank among the 15 greatest generals in history. All right. Next is going to be a controversial choice, I'm sure, for some of them. And this is Shaka Zulu. Shaka Zulu. And he, he lived from uh, 1787 to 1828. Now, some of you may be saying, who the hell is that? Well, he was uh, the uh, he was a, a Zulu conqueror of in South Africa who lived in the area that today is known as South Africa, and he's the only commander uh, on this list which comes from uh, sub-Saharan uh, Africa, and that isn't that's not that's not why he's on this list. He's on this list for for very valid and very good other reasons. As I said, we have to judge men by not only by their influence but by their by having done the most with the little tools that they had and by any standard this guy was was very much like a genghis khan or a, or a tamerlane of uh, sub-saharan africa this uh, shaka zulu is a very still a very controversial figure because there's some scholar, scholarly debate over exactly uh, what he did or uh, you know whether he truly did all the innovations that are credited to his name but i think from my studies from a careful consideration of the evidence, I do think that he is deserving of all the respect that he has been given in the modern period. And this was a guy who basically came from nothing, and he unified a number of different uh, nations, uh, tribes, or peoples, or uh, uh, in his in his region, and became the most powerful of all the uh, Zulu kings, the Zulu leaders. He was a unifier, like a lot of the other men on this list. He was a unifier. Now, also, what I think is is very, very significant is he was a tactical and a and a uh, technological innovator. He introduced uh, a lot of uh, innovations, which I don't have time to go into, but in terms of certain types of uh, throwing uh, weapons and missiles, in terms of uh, tactical uh, double double envelopments, uh, using double envelop these these uh, horn shaped uh, formations on the battlefield. So this was a man who had the um, he had the foresight and the brilliance to break out of his immediate intellectual environment and to come up with his own innovations. And I think that we in the West do not give enough credit to cultures that are outside of our immediate uh, experience. And so that's why I think broad reading people, broad reading in nations and continents that are outside of your own experience, because you've got to broaden your education, you've got to learn more about those uh, leaders uh, because you can learn something from everyone. You can learn something from any leader, no matter what uh, um, you know, matter, no matter what continent they're from. And I think it's very unfortunate that we don't have, again, as many firsthand sources as we would like about Shaka Zulu's career. I mean, the same thing could be said for the the New World. If we, it, perhaps, if the if the writing systems of the Inca and the Aztecs had been better preserved, maybe there are generals there who would. Uh, rewrite our entire views of uh, great uh, undoubtedly there must have been great commanders in the new world that in, in the pre-columbian era but we just don't know about them because there's no written record so again there is an inherent level of filtering here that's that's gone on so we have to try to keep a global perspective all right finally uh the chinese emperor uh uh qin shi huang Qin Shi Huang, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, it's spelled Q-I-N-S-H-I-H-U-A-N-G, and he lived from uh, 259 B.C. to 210 B.C., and he was the architect of the modern... He was the first emperor of a unified China, and his military feats... Uh, again, he was a unifier. He subjugated all of the various different warring Chinese tribes or peoples or regions and brought them together under one flag. And again, uh, we have to we have to admit that China is certainly uh, one of the most, if not again, the most influential up and coming power in the world today. And uh, the concept of a, of a unified Chinese state or empire dates back to Qin Shi Huang and his experience as a commander. He was the one who built the, the Great Wall of China, and he accomplished the um, the great feats. 
uh, that are that are credited to his name. So, uh, and I'm going to list on my site when I post this uh, this podcast. I'm going to list the names of all these these figures with the dates of birth and death, so you can have the list. All right, one last thing, honorable mention. Honorable mention who did not make the list, but I think I have to say uh, Julius Caesar. Uh, again, um, you know, uh, his conquests uh, uh, of Gaul proved to be uh, extremely enduring. And if you read uh, Julius Caesar's commentaries, which I have, you can see just how just how subtle and how diplomatically astute he was in just balancing all these Celtic tribes against each other and maneuvering uh, through and around them to accomplish the um, the uh, the subjugation of, of Gaul under the Roman banner, which conquest which lasted to be permanent essentially, uh, and and uh, the 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 conception of the modern state of France really dates from his his conquest. Also in the Civil War. His tactical brilliance in defeating Pompey is, is unrivaled and, and masterful, and deserves close study. But I, you know, I had to make the cutoff somewhere. I don't know if Caesar belongs on the list of the 15 most influential in history, uh, or 15 greatest commanders in history. Uh, it's, it's it's debatable. But I tried to balance all these factors when I was coming up with the list. So again, I'm sure there are going to be those who disagree with my assessments. But hey. So be it. Bring it on. Uh, let's discuss it. All right. So that's the list. That's my list here. Again, I will um, post the the names on my site. Hopefully, this will generate some thought in your mind. And I urge you to come up with your own list. If you don't agree with my list, hey, come up with your own list. Come up with your own list and try to evaluate what you think uh, are the proper criteria for selection. All right. Until then, I'm Quintus Curtius. Thank you for joining me. Good night.